Smart relays are super useful, but they can be really hard to understand. If someone's using them, they're usually hidden behind a wall and you'd never know. And these devices mix smart home connectivity with the physical and the electrical world in your home. So today, I'm gonna give you a beginner's guide to getting into smart relays. And I'm gonna do it by featuring a brand new device from Acara. Now this is the new dual relay module T2. It's capable of AC or DC powering, wet or dry contact control, and it's a dual relay. So it can control two things at once. It has power monitoring, communicates through Zigbee, and can even be used with the new Matter standard. That means it can control everything from light switches and wall outlets to things like your garage door opener, and it can even be used with motors like rollers for curtains or blinds. Now there's a ton it can do, so you'll be seeing much of this today as we go through Smart Relays 101. Hello automators, thanks for tuning in again. I'm Brian from Automate Your Life and we're gonna go through smart relays because they are something that a lot of us struggle to use right. And I'm featuring the new Acara Dual Relay Module T2 for a few reasons. Acara has sponsored today's video and they're always great with letting me make the kind of video I want. So it's an absolute pleasure to work with these folks and I have to thank them. This type of video I think is a lot more useful than a simple review. And that's because this is one of the most full featured relays out there today. Cause you can often find relays that do uh, one of the things or a couple of the things that the T2 does, but this relay has pretty much every feature that smart relays tend to have. There's a few things missing, but this lets me address a beginner's guide really well as a focal point. And one other thing, if you're finding some of the terms that I'm using a little difficult, you can leave a note in the comments or you can actually check out some of our other 101 level videos, which are in the description as well. Now I have to address one other thing before I go any further in this video. Relays are a highly technical device. Therefore, at a bare minimum, you should be vetting all of your diagrams with an electrician and in a lot of cases, you should be using an electrician for installation. In fact, that's my recommendation. Now I'm not an electrician and while I do have a background in electrical engineering, I will be providing you what I can but I'm not a professional electrician. And all of this is what I've learned and is not professional advice. There, I had to caveat this whole thing because everyone's so darn litigious these days. But let's start with an explanation of what a smart relay is and what it does. A smart relay is like a light switch without that physical button, at least most of the time. It allows you to open and close circuits just like a light switch does. Now, when you flick a light switch up, you're normally opening the circuit there and stopping your light bulb from receiving the current it needs to turn on. Then when you close the switch, you're providing that current and the light turns on. A smart relay allows you to do this using software and through home automation. In this case, we can use Acara's application and then connect it to other platforms to use your favorite voice assistant or other automations, routines, and apps. Things like Amazon, Google Home, Apple HomeKit, and Samsung SmartThings, just to name a few. Those can all be used to open and close the relay contacts, just like physically operating a switch. So some relays allow you to do this with more than one circuit or switch, which is what the dual relay module means on this device. It allows you to control two circuits. And when you see it show up in the Acara app and most apps, it has two separate controls and you can name them independently. So if you stick this behind a set of light switches, you can name each one for the different lights or different things that it controls. Now each relay has its own set of specifications for what it can control and what it can't. It also has specifications for the type of power that you can bring in. So for example, the dual relay module T2 can accept both AC 
and DC power input. With an AC input, it can handle up to 2500 watts of power throughput. It has a maximum of 10 amps and that is specific to being used with things like incandescent lights. The ratings change based on the type of electronic you're using with it and you can see that motors and different types of lights have different ratings associated with them. These specifications need to be paid attention to because a relay will often have certain types of protection on it, but depending on the device you buy, it might not be really well protected. And since most relays sit inside of your wall or inside of a housing of some sort, you want that protection so that issues are handled inside the device and don't get worse inside of your wall. So what I'm saying is you want the relay to trip offline or open the contact so that it doesn't eventually burn and cause a fire. Now you'll notice that the DC ratings of the dual relay module are restricted to resistive loads and that's an important component. A motor is not a resistive load and I'm not going to go into all the different types of loads but when powering this by DC you would not be able to run a motor. I mentioned that the dual relay module T2 has some protection on it and it has both overload and overheat or what we call thermal protection on it. So if the device itself is getting too hot or if there's too much amperage running through it, it's going to protect itself and trip offline. Relays have things like temperature and humidity ratings and you should pay attention to those, but something that every smart relay has is a wireless communication method or protocol. The dual relay module T2 uses Zigbee and you will need a Zigbee hub from Akara with it, at least in most cases. That's where you're going to get all of the different settings that I'll be talking about today and where you will get the most features. This may work with other smart home hubs, but I won't be addressing all of that today. You'll see a few things that I did, but we won't spend a lot of time on that because the point is most of these relays work best with the app from the manufacturer. And that's just because you get all of the settings that you will need to manage these devices in those apps. Now let's start getting into how a relay works. And I'm going to break down all of these different contacts on the T2. As I do that, you should start to understand what some of these terms on electrical diagrams mean. I'm going to start describing some of the ways that you wire a relay, but these are just some of the basics to get you started. You'll notice that every smart relay has a set of holes in the top. At least this is the case for every relay I've seen. What you do is you open it up by unscrewing the little screw and then you insert a cable in and then screw it back down in order to make a connection. One thing that you should think about is having a good pair of wire strippers because you need to only strip so much off of the jacket on the cable you're using. You really shouldn't have bare wire be any longer than the depth of the hole you're inserting it into. Now some of those words make me giggle a little bit but you really just shouldn't see bare conductor or bare wire sticking out because if you do could end up shorting out two cables as these relays can make an electrical box very crowded. Now in a lot of cases you will see connections on wiring diagrams that look like this. It's just two lines or more than two lines intersecting. You could see a little dot being used to represent that connection point. What both of those things mean is that you are connecting cables together. A lot of creators or videos on YouTube will call that a pigtail because you twist the wires together. But I like using Wago connectors as they are a simple way to connect two or more cables. You simply insert the cable and push down the little physical switch. And I have Wago connectors that go all the way up to five different cable connection points. Again, you want to strip the wires to the right length and you want those connections to be really good. Now, what I mean by that is really important. The way that many electrical fires start is in four ways. The first way is just to exceed the ratings of the relay. You have to pay attention to those. We've already talked about that. The second way is to incorrectly wire something. 
Now, the third way is to short or connect two wires that shouldn't be connected. And the fourth way is to make a bad connection. Now the amount of fires that I've seen created by a wire that was not fully connected to the surface that it was intended to be connected to, it's just about every fire I've seen personally. And I've seen hundreds, okay? So electrons flow across the surface of the two connecting sides and heat is generated by those electrons flowing across the surface. So if you have more surface, you will have less of a buildup of heat versus when you have less surface. And all of that heat is being put into a small surface area. The buildup of heat gets much worse when you have actual gaps too because the electrons, all depending on the voltage, can jump across distances in air and that heats up the air very fast and we usually see fires off of that just like lightning now it's more complicated than that but you just want the connection to be solid and you want to use as much wire as you can to make that connection but then not leaving wire exposed so you end up with other wires touching it or with a short now what is a short it's more or less touching two wires together that shouldn't be touching that means current flows somewhere you don't want it to, and it usually results in a melted relay, or worse yet, melted components in your wall. And that is one of the biggest things that you will have to pay attention to. A relay is adding a lot of physical material into an electrical box, and you just plain old might not have the space to put it in there with all of the excess cabling you're gonna be putting in your wall and the excess physical device. And finally, just so I don't have to say this a ton throughout the video, you need to turn off the power before wiring anything in. Obviously, if you're just connecting cables into the relay and the relay is not powered, you don't have any power to turn off. But as soon as you go into a wall outlet or a light switch or anything with power on, disconnect the power by turning off your breaker and then making sure that you test that that power is gone. Also, before you turn off the power, make sure that your pen tester is working. Use an outlet that you know is powered and it will show you that your meter is working by starting to beep or flash. All of this to say that you should get an electrician to help you, okay? But let's talk about what we physically see on these relays and some of the contacts and what they mean. Now the T2 has a large number of contacts on it. And you will find other smart relays have many less contacts on them because they're trying to do less than this one is. You're going to find similar things on other smart relays, but here I'm going to break up the contacts into three sections. But before we do that, you will notice that there's a difference between AC powering and DC powering. When it comes to a DC powered relay, this one specifically gives you a positive terminal and it shows a number of negative terminals. However, only the furthest most right terminal or contact is to be used for the negative side of your DC power. Now, when we talk about AC powering, this relay can go from 100 to 250 volts. So it's ready for both the European and the North American standards. You'll also notice that it's 50 or 60 Hertz power, which is an important distinction for the different power systems around the world. North America uses 60 Hertz power and uh, Europe and most of Asia uses 50 Hertz power. So this relay is actually potentially capable of doing 220 volts at 60 or at 50 Hertz. Let's break up these contacts. Now on the right hand side, we have an L and an N. These are carrying the power in your home to and from the source. So your utility. The L stands for live. This is sometimes referred to as the hot wire. Think of it like it is the source of the voltage in your box. This can often directly connect to your electrical panel in your home. Although live wires can sometimes be run through multiple switches or outlets, depending on how your home was wired. So this is always carrying current. It's the serious wire. The N stands for neutral and this specific relay requires a neutral. Some don't, but they are few and far in between. And relays that don't have a neutral requirement can often be restricted in what they can do and in their specifications. The neutral wire carries electricity 
back to the power source, or it completes the circuit. For electrical current to move through your home, you have to have a full circuit. Now often the neutral is connecting to a ground or what is called a bus bar back at your panel. It's a big piece of metal. Now here's the funny thing with neutrals. They may or may not be carrying current, but you do have to assume that they always are. The other part of most new homes is a ground wire, and there is no pin for a ground wire on this relay. So you won't be connecting a ground to this device specifically, but you will often have a ground wire that already connects to your light switch or your outlet or whatever you're using. Now let's move to the left side of this relay. You'll notice that there's an L1 and an L2 contact. These are the load contacts for the two devices you can control. So if you were controlling a light switch and you wanted to use L1, this would be the cable that heads to the light bulbs. There is no difference between L1 and L2. They just allow you to control two separate electronic devices if you'd like. Now the L out and L in pins are there to let you switch between what's called a wet and a dry contact mode. This takes a bit of explanation, so stay with me. The L in pin always has the power coming from your live wire. That means if you wire in 120 volt AC power, the L in pin will have that also. The L out pin does not carry that power. And what you will find is that any time we are trying to use the 100 to 250 volt AC power from our homes, that you will have to use an included jumper cable between the L in and L out contacts. That essentially brings the power over to your load contacts. So the L1 and L2 ones. That's what we call wet contacts. They are using the power to drive the loads that is provided on the live side over to those loads. So it's the same power in as the same power out. But a dry contact means that you wanna use whatever voltage and current is available within the circuit that your load is using. The best example of that is your garage door opener, which can often be a very low voltage and extremely uh, low current. When you press the button on your wall, you're essentially closing the circuit but you're not using that 120 volt power that's in North American homes. So a dry contact is for those devices that don't need the full power from your home. You're going to know this going into any project, but I think for most applications, people will be using the wet contact method and therefore be using the included jumper cable on this specific relay. Now the last set of contacts are on the bottom of this relay. They are the S1, S2, and COM contacts. S1 lines up with L1. So the way the relay works is that when you physically close S1 using, let's say, your existing light switch, it will reflect that on the L1 line and close that circuit. That way, your physical switch still works, but you also have this other automated control method with all your automation tools. The same is true of S2, which lines up with L2. Now the COM line is usually just the other side of your physical switch. I'll show you an example in just a few moments as we will now move to a number of examples for how to use smart relays in your home. I'm gonna show you diagrams, wiring methods, and methods for getting some of your biggest use cases working. But first, we need to power up the relay. This is a good practice, I think, and a good introduction to working with a relay. So let's get to it. Within the specifications of every smart relay, you will find something called the minimum load rating. And if you don't find that, then you need to get it from the company's support line. For the T2 from Akara, it has no minimum load requirement, which means I can power it without providing a load, without providing, for example, a light bulb to connect to it. So I don't need to connect a light bulb in order to power this on and to have it work correctly. Now most relays, you can do that, but you need to talk to the company before doing what I'm about to show you. Everybody I know has a spare cable that looks like this. It'll have the three prongs and you could use a two prong cable truthfully, but just make sure that the cable has a rating equal or greater 
than your relay in terms of current and voltage as well. Then you cut one end of the cable based on the length you would like to have and then you strip down the two cables. Here in North America you can see that I'm plugging the black live on my relay. Again, check with a professional because this is a moment where you can blow up your relay. Then I have put electrical tape over and closed off my ground pin because, again, I don't have a ground pin on this relay. Then, this is a cable that can power the relay in order to set it up and it has a secondary use case for those dry contact scenarios. This is really easy to use with a garage door opener because this allows you to run the power to a nearby outlet instead of trying to connect it into the physical garage door opener in some weird way. And once you power on the relay, you have access to the setup process, which for the T2 means that I can open up the Acara application, go to add a new device, and find the T2. This specific relay requires a Zigbee hub from Acara to be found, and then it uses that going forward for communication to and from the relay. Now, sometimes those electrical boxes or those places we're gonna put this relay in are really difficult for Zigbee or Z-Wave or other types of wireless communication to get out of. Now, you'll notice this little wire and this flat black piece coming out of the relay. This is the Zigbee antenna and you can't cut that off for this relay to communicate. If you're having trouble communicating to your relay, then you might want to relocate that little antenna just a little bit inside your wall. With other relays, you might not have that opportunity. But as you get this connected to the Acara app, you will see that you get to name two separate devices. You can also choose a different icon per relay and a different usage case. The choices are switch, light, fan, or an other type of device. Once those are set, you can control the two loads connected to the relay with a simple on off button control in the app. We will go through the different settings on this specific relay in a little while, but for now, if you're taking this step, then I would always open the relay contacts. That means you turn off each device and leave them off. The reason I say that is when you go to wire this into something else and then you power on the relay, you won't instantly connect it to whatever load you have attached it to. It's just a safety thing, but in general, you don't want that to happen. Now keep in mind that many relays don't need you to take that first step, but that cable I just showed you how to make will be used in most dry contact situations. Now let's move on to using this relay with a wall outlet to make it smart. It's actually really easy to do, but I'm also going to show you how sometimes when you get into your wall, things are a little bit different and we need to modify our plan. I'm also going to show you how you can wire up a lot of different devices in your home in the same way as the wall outlet. So this works for a lot of situations. Let's go. All right, so we're gonna wire up an outlet, but I'm gonna show you how just about every time you get into your home's electrical system, something's different. And I mean, I even had these boards made up and I asked for a simple diagram and well, things are a little bit different here because we tried to do a few extra things. This is what happens. Now, we're going to use our Acara Relay that has the L in, L in and L out pins tied together or jumpered. Uh, that's because we're using wet contact mode and that's because we're getting the power directly here, okay? That's the way I'm gonna explain it. Now, when you go into most outlets, this is what you're going to find. Ignore these two cables right here. You're going to find a cable coming in and it's going to go into the switch on one side and then you're going to find another cable coming in going to the switch on the other side and then you will find a third potentially bare conductor maybe green conductor that is your ground cable but what i found when i came into this was a second pair and that's because they have daisy chained these two things together. Now in a lot of homes, what'll happen is you'll have a daisy chained wall outlet or a set of wall outlets. Because we have this relay, there's a number of different ways that we can wire this in. And it gets 
complicated to explain some of this. But if we just wanted to wire this in, I got a number of diagrams here. If we just wanted to wire this in with a single relay controlling everything, this is the kind of diagram we would use. What's happening is we're coming from the source, we're coming into the line of this relay, and then essentially, okay, it's more complicated than this, there's a switch inside and this is what you're closing or opening when you turn on the relay for L1 or switch 1. Okay, that's what you're closing right there. Again, it's more complicated, but then if you close that, if you turn it on, then it provides power over to the line side. That's this side, okay? This switch tells me it says hot on it. Uh, I can tell for other reasons with the colors of cables, things like that. The other thing that we will have to do is we will have to modify our neutral. Okay, so we go neutral, and then you're noticing we're going into the relay, okay, into its neutral port right there. And then we are also going into the neutral on this. Now in this case, this is our white cable right here. And I've already explained a little bit how neutrals work, but essentially all of your neutrals are tied together and they all go back to the source eventually. And that's where everything goes back to if it needs to, okay? All of these neutrals are tied together, but what's happening here is a pigtail or a connection of two wires. So we're gonna go into the relay and we're also going to go into the outlet. Now, what happens over here on the load side, so we have this load and we're going into the load of our, or the live, sorry, <laughs> I should say that right, uh, the live or the hot side of our outlet one. But we're also pigtailing off and we're going over to the live side of our other outlet. So in this case, when we look here, I can tell by looking in my box and the way this was wired in. So this black was over here. It was connected to the hot. This white was connected over on the neutral side. Um, so I know that this is going over here. So this cable in my diagram is right here. Okay, so I just have to pigtail off of a load cable to go to both. Uh, so I really just need one cable, tie it together, and then I gotta come this way. Now, there is another diagram that we could create and a different scheme that we could create here. So what if we want to control both of the wall outlets individually? Okay, so I, I had drawn this wrong the first time, and this is where you know you need to be looking at things really objectively, really thinking about what you're doing, and make sure you have a professional involved. But, you know, I had two cables. I had this second cable going to my second outlet. Outlet. Uh, and instead, what I'll be doing is I'll be plugging that into L2. And so we're just going over to that switch with that cable. And now I will have individualized control. Now keep in mind that that is restricting ratings to the entire thing, okay? You have to be careful with that. So this is the way I'm going to wire it up today, but it's diagrams like these that you need to create for yourself and have checked with an electrician if you're gonna try and perform this work yourself. Just because it's, it's very easy to do, I'm going to connect this cable in but look look at how much space i have here so this is something that you want to deal with like these are not nearly as deep as uh, your other contacts or your other connections that will have been made so i've cut it way down and i mean that's as much conductor as you need with this one then it's going in and i'm going to tie this down now and we're actually wired up for that second outlet. 
uh, we'd have to we have to deal with the neutral but we're actually wired up for it so now I'm going to attach the live side the hot side and that of course is going in to the live side of this you see I've got too much cable again with a threaded cable you know after you get it cut you just want to you want to get it uh, tied together well now on the neutral side of things we got to get a little a little smarter this is the neutral coming from my box okay it's on the right hand side that's how I know my power cable is over here on this box so that's how I know you're gonna have to figure that out in your own home what direction things are coming from now just so this is really clear to you I have a Wago connector it has three pins on it you can buy these much larger than this there are three lines coming into that dot okay I draw them with a dot not everyone does but one in one out to here and one out to here so when your diagram has all of that you need a three pin connector now the truth is I could connect this other neutral right to here and then um, I would have four four dots right or four lines out this one's in and I just close that down now it's in there I don't have any white cable don't get so angry at me in the comments but I don't so I'm going to put this one in here I could cut down that cable too like you don't need so much cable and you know honestly you should have less on these extra cables that you're you're working with like this should probably only be this long so now I've got two cables in on my neutral I've got another yellow cable so at least my cables are color coded you know <laughs> it's so much trouble with the electricians like they are they, I'm just I'm making this a little easier on myself I'm using the connection points on my existing wall outlet now guys in case you're not noticing there's no way I'm fitting this in my wall box all of this like if that's not clear right now <laughs> it should be clear and while I'm here might as well do this last one and get all my neutrals dealt with so then my neutral side of the diagram is done this one too okay don't get too mad at me about the colors of the cables okay now we actually only have one additional cable to do and then we're ready to power this up the cable we're doing is our l1 to our hot side okay so for that i've purchased some additional cable that matches the amperage in my home and you have to make sure of that okay so i prepped a cable now you'll notice this end is a little bit longer than this end this is a 14 gauge cable right here okay so that helps you to understand the size that's how much material essentially is in here and it also helps you to understand ratings now this cable you can see rated 200 celsius uh, and it will have an amperage rating that is different per area per country okay so i'm not going to give you the rating of this cable Okay, that's tied down and then this has just got to go over here somewhere now let's review I have everything wired up and I think things are gonna work just right I've gone through my diagram a couple of times I've re-looked at my wiring so I've checked everything I can obviously we could have still made a mistake but you're trying to eliminate as much of that as you can you can see no bare conductors coming out of this that's great we can see no bare conductors on any of the connection points and I've given them all little tugs I had one come out I didn't put that in right uh, and 
they're not coming out. Now you don't want to rank on things, but just make sure that they're not coming out. And honestly, at this point, we have to try and fit everything in the box. Now look, this is a big deal, right? I can't even get that in the box. I could maybe do that, but the depth of this box. So one of the biggest things that you need to make sure of is that your relay actually fits inside okay and that is uh, you know you're gonna get the sizing dimensions but think of all these extra cables that you would have to fit in here too now for me what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug this in all of you safety people get ready to get a little bit angry at me as I do this with the conductors a little bit exposed uh, okay so we're turning it on okay so now I have power to this, but these are not closed, okay? And I've labeled them one and two. So one, because I've wired it into this outlet, should turn on that outlet. Now I heard it, I heard it come here, and now I have power to that. And we haven't turned on this yet. So, individually, wired and working at this point. So now I have individual control of these two devices. This would allow you to individually control two outlets or anything that's daisy chained in your home. So this scenario can work very well. Of course you have to pay attention to the ratings of everything in here and that's where you want to check your diagrams and you want to check how much load you'll be able to put in based on the requirements and the restrictions on this. I just want to explain something that's going to happen when you look at these diagrams. This should set you free a little bit. Uh, this is the diagram I had just drawn but my relay is a little bit, well it's sideways. So with these standard loads, I've, I've drawn this as an outlet, that's why he's got a little happy smiley face, but almost every time with the standard loads, it really won't matter uh, what type of load you have here. You're going to do three things basically every time. You're gonna tie together the neutrals, okay? You're gonna disconnect the live, and instead of that live going into the live side of the original device, you're gonna go in to the live side of your relay. Then you're going to tie the live side to your L1, or could be your L2. Now for most of these loads, you will have that jumper pin in between L1 or L in and L out. This is going to be something very consistent as a, a structure when you go to wire in things. And when you get into the wall, you're in general going to find the ground, the live or the hot and the neutral into your device. And this is going to be the method that you use to wire in a lot of these things. So I've seen this type of a diagram used for a lot of different things, including like uh, electric floor heating. Now most people are probably gonna try to use a relay to make their light switches smart. Now, one of the great things about relays is that you can usually still use your physical light switch after you've wired this in. At least that's if it's one that's ready for that. And with a module like this, you can actually wire in two different light switches at the same time. Let's go. So this would be your standard light switch, kind of the diagram for a single pole light switch. Now I haven't connected a neutral. You might have your neutral connected to your light switch, but regardless, what's happening is live into the one side of the switch, and then we go out to the load, to the bulb, to whatever else. Now this could be a fan. This could be a lot of different loads. And this is looking very similar to our standard loads diagram. There's barely any differences 
between uh, these. So it's really the same thing again and again when we add in the relay. So we're going into the neutral of the relay and we're going in to the live here. And we're removing these connections to the light switch. And we're also removing the connection to the bulbs themselves. So if you didn't want to use the switch at all, this is all you would do. You could, other than the ground, which you wanna think about in your electrical box, you could actually just remove this switch. It's not, it's not necessary. And now you have all of your automated controls over here on your relay. The difference with a light switch versus many of the other things is we might want to use the relay's ability to control based off of a light switch. So what happens in this case is, again, the load side, it mirrors that L1. So that's all you have to kind of think about here is into there. The live side, it's going to come down. That, that means I'm those lines are not touching, by the way. And there you go. So this allows this light switch to tell the relay what to do with your L1 load contact. So to turn that on and off. So in this case, really, all this is doing is closing a little circuit for the relay to know, okay, time to turn that on. And just because I'm sure many of you will ask, what happens if you add a second light switch is that the common is your live. So you're going to end up tying together the two lives of your light switches. They will come into the common. The load will come in to S2 from that second switch. So I've got light switch one, light switch two. I'm just going to put the live right here just to make this easier on me. Okay, just on my drawing. And then on this side, I'm gonna put the load side. And this, I'm gonna skip that, come out here. And now we're into S2 with the load side of this one. And of course, the only other thing that we have to add is that bulb from our source two. So, okay, so now we have our load two connected into bulb two. We have our load one, our bulb one connected into load one. And we have the load sides of these light switches going into S1 and S2 uh, directly. Now, obviously I've got a two way switch, okay? Or sometimes called a, a single pole, all right? Now that's, that's it, it's an on and off switch and we wanna add this to the dual relay module. Of course, as always, first step, pull the power. Now the second step is obviously to open things up and start having a look inside. You may or may not see uh, your switch connecting or having three different pins on it, four if you count the ground. Ground is often indicated by that little green screw there, but it's gonna depend on your own place and the switches that have been used and where you are in the world. Now there will be, in some cases, uh, little labels on these different pins, but actually in my case, I don't have that. Now, there's kind of easy ways to, to test out, you know, if you bring power into the box and you bring the pen tester up to a pin, let's say you bring it up to here and you do have power in this box, obviously you need to be very careful when doing this, but you can test to see if there's power here when the light is not on. And you can conversely test if there's power here again when the light is not on when you find no power that is your load that is the cable that's going to your light bulb so that can help you just to get started this one is going to my load now i can tell because if you look down here 
I remove some of these other cables, you'll see that this is on the right hand side. It's heading this way. This other black cable is my live or my hot. That is always what we're looking for to put into the live side of our relay. I also have these white lines here. These are my neutrals. They're not being used currently in this switch configuration. You can see I have a Wago connector and I have two cables tied together, but uh, maybe I was smart enough to put that third there for what we're about to do. Now there's a number of ways to wire this in, but really only one way that makes all of the different settings and all of the different features of this relay work correctly. Now, I've tried to simplify how this is all going to work for you a little bit, but <laughs> I realize this stuff gets confusing. Here, okay, we wired from our load side of our switch into the S1, the switch one, okay? We wired the live side into the common, to the COM port, okay? This is going to allow this switch as it opens and closes to tell the relay that load one is being turned on or turned off by the switch, okay? The second piece is that we have wired in three cables. Now, our original load cable and our L1 cable are ready to go. These have to be tied together, okay? This is so that whenever we turn on L1, that the load gets turned on, or the light bulb in this case. The line side also has to be tied together. So we can kind of put our load over there and we have from the line and the line. Now this obviously is going to be hot all the time when power is on in your home or in this box. So just keep that in mind. This little connector always has voltage. So just to recap, our switch is wired in physically to these bottom ports. The load side goes into S1, which matches up directly with L1. That's because we're tying our loads to the switch. Now, that doesn't mean that this switch is necessarily gonna turn on our lights. That is what our uh, settings here will determine. So let's just turn this on see how it performs. So I've just turned everything on. I have my switch in the off position. I'm gonna turn that on, turns on my light bulb, turn it off, turns off my light bulb. Now you'll notice there was a little bit of a delay there. It's not as instantaneous as it was. The reason for that is it's going through this and the relay is actually turning on and off that L1. Now, why is it doing that? Well, I'm gonna go into my device settings. There's a couple of things that you need to look at. The switch type, I have a rocker type switch, okay? So that is being put in to this. If I choose disabled and I hit save, look, nothing happens, okay? So you can disable your switch in that moment. Okay, I'm gonna go back to rocker type now it's on or off, it's correctly mimicking this physical switch. The other thing that you could do is convert the S1 to a wireless switch, okay? So now you see S1 is just wireless. This is no longer working, okay? This would be the right way to do it with a rocker switch. You'd leave it with the switch type being rocker type convert it to wireless switch mode. I think that's the way that I would do it in general. You could just disable the switch too. This is up to you. There you go, now I have the device. I think it's working the right way. So I'm gonna turn that on and you can see my switch is not on. So the way it works now, if my relay is on, I turn it off, okay, my relay goes off. If my relay is on, and I turn the switch on, 
it's acting like a three-way device there. So primary control is actually whatever you're controlling it from. And I think that's a really important piece uh, to how you want to work with these relays in general. Whatever is your next thing that you're switching, you're kind of telling it, okay, change state, right? So this switch, it could be reversed now, and that's something to keep in mind. After this, it's gonna get more and more complicated to add additional switches and a different configuration. So I'm not gonna go through all of those different wiring diagrams, but you have this basis now where you understand this is your physical world and it gets translated to the uh, relay world. Okay, the electrical world. Now that we've handled those two basic situations in your home, I think it's pretty obvious that you need to be making sure that you have the space inside of that electrical box. That is something that you wanna chat with an electrician about so that you know how to fit everything inside the box in your specific case. In some situations, you might actually have to expand the box behind the wall or you might just have to cut down some cables and deal with it in the future if you ever replace that relay. But let's go on to one of the most often used situations, which is those pesky garage door openers. I'm gonna show you how to get this wired in, but I'm also going to explain a lot of the nuances with garage door openers and what you might find when you start this process. One of the most common use cases for a relay like this is to deal with garage door installations. Now there's actually some really interesting options with the Acara uh, T2. Now I'm just gonna draw this out quickly. Here's my live, here's my neutral. We've been through a number of these diagrams. And unfortunately with most garage doors, when you're dealing with the contacts in the door, you don't wanna be hitting them with 120 volt AC fully, okay? So when we're talking about our relay, we have to move into dry contact mode. Now, this is something that you need to understand about your garage door, but it's easy to understand it, and I'll show you how to do that. What you do have to do is you have to connect in your live and your neutral to power. This is just for relay power, okay? So this gives the relay the power it needs to communicate. Now, we have done that already really early in today's video with this cable, okay? So you're actually just gonna connect that in. I'm gonna show you that in just a moment. The next thing you're going to do, and this is what you should be doing before you even try to buy this, okay? Is you're gonna take a little cable, just like this, the same size as what you have out on your garage door. And a car gives you this cable, but you're gonna take this out, okay? Because we're moving to dry contact mode. So that is out. Now what you're going to do with this is you're going to touch this to the two uh, contacts for the two wires coming from your garage door controller. And you're just gonna make that touching connection and you're gonna see if your garage door moves. So obviously you gotta make sure no one's around your garage door, you're doing this safely, but you're gonna make that connection. If that works, then you can use the relay for your garage door. If it does not, you've got something more complex, this is not necessarily going to work. If it does work, then what you're going to do is you're gonna take those two wires from your garage door controller and you're going to connect them to your L out and your L1. And that's actually all you have to do for a garage door. 
Now, a lot of us have smart home sensors that have relay contacts on them, and that would allow me to then take the two contacts from that and put it in to the S1 and the COM ports. And you're able to put that into the S1 and COM, and that would give this the ability to know if the door had been opened. You can buy lots of wired contact sensors that can go directly in into there. So uh, there are some restrictions on the voltage and amperage of that kind of a thing, but you know you could just do this and then you could separately use a door sensor uh, from any number of companies, maybe a Cara's door and window sensor, put that on there, put that on your garage door and then you'll know both of those things at the same time. So let's go try and do this in my garage. Before I head out to my garage door with this relay, I'm gonna prep it, okay? I've taken out my jumper cable. Okay, that's out of there. The next thing I'm gonna do is I have this cable that I prepped earlier in the video. The white is going into my neutral and the black is going in to my live or my hot. And then I'm gonna tie these two into our relay. If I wanted to add that wired contact sensor, I could put it in to my S1 and my COM ports. I'm not doing that in my home today. Now, the one thing I'll tell you, you should probably do before you head out there and put this in your garage. Plug in your relay, turn it on, and then go into the Acara Home app or just on the relay here, make sure that that blue light is turned off. That means no contacts are closed. So what that will mean is when you go to plug in all your cables, you won't instantly move your garage door, okay? And you can check in the app. The other thing you can do is unplug your cable, wait a few seconds, plug it back in, make sure that those contacts don't suddenly go closed because of an automation. Okay, so this into there. There you go. That's how it came up to this. You can see this one says infrared sensor. So that's this cable. And then plus and minus. Plus when I pull one of these cables out, my button over there goes dark. So you can see it's got a red light on it now. And now it doesn't. So. That's how I was able to tell that this was coming from my push button. So now it's just connecting these two into the L1 and the L out of my uh, relay and then plugging in up there with my power cable. I've got as thin of a gauge of wire as I could find and I'm just gonna start prepping a couple of things. Now I'm gonna cut a couple of lengths of these and I'm gonna keep them fairly consistent just so that I can get a little distance from the door with the relay or from the garage door opener with the relay. Now I'm going to make a couple of these pins a good length, but not like a crazy length. So we're just gonna wire strip, there we go. And then uh, this is how I twist them. Okay, and just holding them. That's because this cable is threaded. Okay, and then I'm going in to here. Gotta be a little careful with this. Snap that down. Now it's stuck in there. Okay. Now, one of these is going into our relay. There it is. You can see that's a 
shorter end. And that one I'm putting in to L1. And we're gonna tie that down. It's not gonna pull out. This is going into L out. Okay. All right. So now this and this cable are gonna go into the existing garage door opener. And mine is really, really deep. Uh, so I'm gonna make these quite long so that I make a good connection. Now when I'm out there at my garage door, I will be putting the cables from my, uh, from my existing garage door opener into here. I'm hoping this isn't too much copper to kill that signal. I'm really hoping that it will stay in this Wago connector. Okay. Set that all down. I set this up here. Two of those through. Okay. And then this is going in my Wago. Okay, that's in there, good connection. Now we gotta do this one. Open this up. Okay, now we have to connect in the black to here. As this is threaded, it could be a little difficult. Get that in there, pull a little bit to the side. Okay, now we've got this. Okay. And we'll just put this in there. I'm gonna pull a little bit that way. So these don't touch, they're too long. So I'll strip those after. Uh, but now I just have to plug this in and everything should work. Let's see. Okay. This didn't turn on, which is what we wanted. Now, we did want to see this keep working. That's perfect, right? That has to continue to work, and because we connected the three cables together, it continues to work. Now, let's see. There you go. Let's try it. There you go. Easy, you might have to play with the settings, but in general, that's working great. So I have everything wired up for this switch one to be a garage door opener. But you do need to make some modifications in terms of how you are controlling things. Now the power off memory, I think in general you do want it to say remember last date or always off after power is restored. You don't want a pulse to come through and then open your garage door. And speaking of which, I've switched my switch type to a button type. That actually didn't seem to matter, but uh, I'm gonna do that anyways, just because it's accurate in case a car ever updates settings, and then that does matter. I didn't convert this to a wireless switch because I'm not using uh, the sensor in this, okay? So you'll wanna think about that. If you do put a sensor in there, I believe, you'll have to turn that on so that the sensor may be going open by accident uh, doesn't cause your door to start opening. Interlock mode, I'm not gonna use that. The device mode, this is the biggest change. Now I changed mine to dry contact pulse mode because if I use the jumper cable and I put it in to the two contacts, then the garage door just moved full. It went open to fully closed or uh, fully closed to fully open. It was taking a single connection as a pulse, okay? The pulse width is how long 
that pulse is going to be for. So I had to set mine around 500 milliseconds. You'll notice sometimes when you press the button in your garage, if you have to press it a little bit longer than just a, a tap like that, well, you might need a little bit longer of a pulse for the garage door to recognize or the controller to recognize that it's time to move. Now, if you have to keep those contacts on, in order to keep the garage door moving, let's say open or closed, then you would need to use the dry contact on off mode. That's about it for this. Now I have a working garage door in my dual relay module T2. Every time I tap that button or I use a voice assistant or any other system, I can yeah, open and close my garage door remotely. The final installation I will be doing today is a little bit abstract, so we've kind of been working to this. But it's almost impossible to cover everything that you'll run into. I will tell you that this is a very simplistic situation that I ran into and yours could be more difficult, but this could help you to wire in a number of appliances that have a switch associated with them. I'm using a light bulb for this demonstration, but it has a little switch on it. So although this will use a lot of the same knowledge that we've developed over this video, you should learn that things like this aren't that complex. This is a bit of a discovery project, and honestly, you're going to run into this a lot. Now, this is a very simple switch we have here on and off just turns on and off any light bulb. We're gonna go into this, and this is where we don't know actually what's going on inside of this switch. If you don't want the physical switch anymore, you're gonna cut around it, and then we're gonna connect it to the Acara uh, device there. But if you want to keep the switch in line, you have to make a decision. Do you want this ahead of the physical switch? So this is where my, my power cable is going. You can see it right there. Do I want it in front of that? So that would mean that the relay is always powered, which I think is what you're gonna wanna do in a lot of cases. And then you can still control manually, physically, through this switch. Now, the other option is downstream of that, so you could kill the power to the relay without unplugging. But, you know, the third option is to actually get into this, see what the switch is made of, and integrate it into this device. That would be through using the bottom three ports in here. And we have to discover what's going on inside of here. So I'm going to open this up and we're going to get into it. Now, obviously, first step, hold the power. This is, it's going to be hard to read a little bit, but right there, iFixit. This is from an iFixit kit that I bought. They have all kinds of little plastic tools that help you to get into little compartments like this. They also have these cards. They have this. Now, I've opened this up a little bit, but just, you know, find whatever little gap you can. Get one of these little tools worked into there and then you're just, you're just kind of getting it started. That should allow you to then move along and continue the process as you go. You just gotta get in, there you go. So now I have opened this up and the point of opening up this switch was to understand what's going on inside of it and how we could use it in conjunction with this. And I think when I look at this, number one, you see the blue line is just bypassing this switch. We can also see physically this way, this direction is closing the contact. I'll try and open it here and then uh, you'll notice that it's kind of popped up. The blue line going straight through, that's our neutral. Okay, so that's how we know now what our neutral is and what our line or our hot is the brown and then eventually our load is this. Now for me, I'm going to install the relay where it always has power. And the reason for that is I don't need a physical switch to turn off my relay. I want this powered all the time. So we're going to cut upstream of the wireless switch and I'm going to give myself 
some good space. Now, <laughs> I'm using 10 snips, okay, guys? Some people are going to get a little bit upset about that, but too bad. Now I have this ready to go, and there I can see my two cables. Now I've got to strip these down. So I've stripped down all of my cabling. I've actually done quite a bit here. Now, this brown wire is going to the switch, the physical switch, and then that goes all the way to the light bulb. Now, the next piece, and you can see I've stripped, I've broken out the outer jacket, that's what you'd call, and I was able to get ratings for the cable off of this, okay? So I broke down the outer jacket, I just wire stripped using these, and then I wire stripped the inner jacket, and then these are threaded cables, so I did tie them or twist them together. That's usually good. You will notice they're a little bit different length. That's because I'm anticipating how I'm wiring this. Now from the wall, this is my entire <laughs> cable there. I'll make a nice heart for you. Um, now you can see I've got the blue cable. I might have to strip back this outer jacket a little bit more and I might have to twist these together a little bit more, but you can see I have uh, strip those. I've also grabbed the same cable so I think we can kind of tell what's going together here. All of our blue cables are going to come together and then one of these is going to go into the neutral for the relay and then the brown when we're coming from the wall that is what we would call our hot, our line. So that right there, that piece is going into here. And then this brown one that's going to the switch, this is the load side. So this is L1 or L2. You can make that determination, but that's where L1 is going into. Now we're ready. So this is my cable that's going into the wall, All right? my plug-in. Obviously I'm not plugged in as I do this and our L is going, our brown is going into L. So with this one, because this cable is fairly small, do have to really pay attention to how this is sitting in there. We need screw to hold down. Try and hold it in the middle. Oh. And we're not just tying this into the neutral. That, uh, that's not gonna work for us. We need to tie all the neutrals together. Now from the switch side, I have to do the same thing with the brown conductor, but I'm gonna go into L1. And I'm just, I'm just checking, I'm making sure things aren't gonna pull out, but I'm not pulling too hard because this is threaded cable. It's very small cable. Now I'm going to take my third set of cables, which are my neutrals, okay? One, two, and we're gonna use three. And really, we're just gonna tie these together. So we wanna get them as lined up as we can. I'm gonna use a wire nut for this. I could use a Wago connector, get them all in there, hold it right here, and start to twist until you feel them starting to turn on themselves and you have a good strong connection. Now this connector just has to go in here. Got a little bit too much exposed conductor. So I'm just gonna cut that. Now it's not beautiful. Don't get me wrong. This is not a beautiful look. So you're gonna have to think about how you're gonna enclose this and how you're gonna hide the box that you're gonna enclose this in. Cause I would recommend that you do enclose it. Look, I've got little wires exposed, little things like that. You don't want anyone touching that stuff. So our wireless switch is not turning on the device because our relay has not allowed the power off. So what we have now is a double uh, control point here for our light. But this can help you kill things like phantom power 
into devices. So I could leave this plugged in. The only phantom power is coming from my relay. Now, of course, I have nothing plugged in to the second contact, so nothing's gonna happen when I turn that one off. But when I turn that one off, there you go. That turns it on and off, and I'll be able to get power readouts from how much is being consumed by this load. With that, if I had wanted to wire in the physical switch, then I would need to solder on or connect another cable onto the two sides of the switch. I would then take those cables into the S1 and COM ports of my relay with those two wires, and it would act a lot like the light switch scenario. Except I think in a lot of cases, you're gonna wanna cut out that physical switch and then have it act just like the light switch where it's not really connected to anything else. That way as you're flicking that switch back and forth, it's just being recognized on the S1 and COM ports. You might end up just buying a whole new switch. So I currently have this relay wired in and it is controlling two individual devices. So on the left, it is controlling, or on the right, sorry, <laughs> this switch is controlling right here. You see, I just turned that off. I could turn it back on uh, and that will come back on and I can turn off this individually and that goes on and off, okay? So we have two devices wired up. They are currently both on, but I'm gonna turn off the bulb just so that we have a difference. So this switch one is on, this switch off is two. Now, when we go into the device settings, we have some additional options. So the power off memory, you have four options for. Remember last state, uh, always on after power is restored, always off and reverse the last state. Now, I think a lot of these are very self-explanatory, but if I turn off the power to this whole setup, and because I have it set in remember last state, and I turn that power back on, this one should come back on and this one should not. And it has done that perfectly. You can see this came back online and we're good to go. The other thing that you will need every time is whether the device is in wet contact mode, uh, dry contact pulse mode, so that just pushes through a single pulse electrically, or an on off, okay? And so in the dry contact mode, you see this little red jumper wire, uh, the dry contact mode will always have no jumper wire in it. Now these other things, these other three settings are a little bit different. So the switch type, these are the different types of switches or sensors that you can connect to the switch ports. Okay, S1, S2, and COM or common. Uh, if you have a rocker type switch up and down, or is it a button type, or do you wanna disable the whole thing? But I don't have anything connected, so that doesn't really matter right now. Uh, do you wanna convert this to a wireless switch? So what this means is if you have a switch, a physical switch tied in on this and you convert to a wireless switch, that physical switch will no longer work. So you have to think about whether you wanna do that. I don't know a lot of cases where you would want that. Uh, there's maybe a few, maybe you wanna disable your garage door controller, something like that, not allow it to do things. Now interlock mode is in a lot of cases going to be used uh, for motors for bi-directional motors. So this is not something you're gonna use a lot of the time personally, but it can help, you know, with, yeah, electric machinery devices, motors in most cases. Uh, it can stop you from instantly applying voltage to both sides and damaging your motor. Most smart relays are gonna connect best with their own application, but lots of us wanna use those other voice assistants and those other systems to control our home. Now, since this one specifically is a Zigbee device, you could potentially connect it to other Zigbee hubs. 
but you've seen the settings that this device has access to and you've seen that they're really important for how it works and those are only available in the Akara app today. You're going to find that with most smart relays and because they are that technical device, you're probably not going to find a good fit within another system to manage those settings. So you're going to want to connect the Smart Relay to the app from the manufacturer. But after that, you can connect Smart Relays to most of the larger types of home automation apps. Amazon, Google, Apple, and Samsung apps are all able to integrate with most brands. I won't walk you through the method for integrating with those companies because it's relatively simple. But here's a quick breakdown. Now with Amazon, you can add the Acara skill in their skill store. With Google, you add a device and then you connect it to your Acara account again. With Apple, you integrate your Acara hub with Apple and it brings all the devices connected to it. And with Samsung Smart Things, you can use Acara's Matter Bridge feature to add a matter device and then choose to add your hub. It will then act a lot like Apple HomeKit and bring in all the devices attached to that hub. Then those systems will be able to control the two relays in this dual relay module. And with most relays, all you're gonna get is a single control point for the relay. One of the only options you will have in those other systems is to turn on and off the relay and to do so through automations in those systems. There's really very little other control so just understand with relays that the primary application is going to be where you'll set all the settings and most of those apps like the Acara app have a very robust automation system themselves but you'll be able to create automations to control relays like the rest of your smart home in those other apps. And one thing that I have found fairly useful with relays is to change the device type in those other applications. You can usually select light or switch or plug and that often describes the device well enough that you get the right controls with things like voice assistance. So for example, I changed one of the relays to a light in the Amazon app and that means when I ask for all the lights to turn on that it turns on that relay. There can be drawbacks to that and for example with the garage door setup you are likely to be restricted on opening and closing that garage door if you set that as the type in an application. That's because it becomes a security device so just watch out when you're changing the device type that you might have to change it back to get the features you want. This is where you're going to need a more advanced guide or at least some additional examples. I'll link a really great video down below in the description that Rob over at the hookup did on his channel. It'll give you a few more scenarios with relays but he was specifically dealing with one brand. You'll have to watch out for the differences but it still should really take your knowledge to another level because you'll be hearing a lot of the same things that I said today with a slightly different set of relays and a few different scenarios. Otherwise, the links are down below for Acara's Dual Relay Module T2. It's a fantastic relay and it's going to do just about everything you need. The other thing that I think I can really help you with are putting this type of a device into the best automations that you can possibly make in your smart home. Now there's a video up on screen right now that will help you expand the types and the level of automations you can create today. So check that out. Otherwise, thanks for watching today. And of course, don't hate, automate.